In this video, I will discuss the second part about the theory of the lasso, focusing now on variable selection. What we've seen in the previous lecture was that the lasso achieves prediction and parameter consistency. Under a few assumptions, in particular that P can grow almost as fast as e to the power n, which basically means you can have many more covariates than you can have observations. But that the number of actually relevant variables, S0, should only grow slowly. So you can have lots of uh, variables in your model to choose from, but only a few of them actually should be relevant. And we also had some restrictions on the tuning parameter. In particular, we looked at the rate at which it should grow, where we basically saw two things. First, lambda cannot be too large, so it should go to zero when n and p increase. Otherwise, you will have a bias which does not disappear when you penalize too heavily. And if your p, the number of variables in your model, is large, then you should penalize more heavily than if the, the number is uh, only small. Now, let's look at what we can say about actual variable selection. One of the reasons why we use the lasso rather than, for instance, rich regression is that it actually sets coefficients equal to zero. And so it's important to realize the distinction between consistency and variable selection. So we might think, well, if our parameter, two parameters equal to zero, then consistency means that actually we also estimate it as zero. It only says, of course, that it converges to zero, but not that you actually achieve a real zero in your estimation. So take a very simple example. Suppose we have some estimator, which is composed of some standard normal random variable z, and you divide it by square root n. And we want to estimate the object zero with it. Well, this is consistent. Of course, if your sample size n goes to infinity, z, which um, is of course standard normal, so it will not actually change with n, divided by something which grows with n, in this case square root n, will go to zero. You will of course never, on the other hand, achieve an exact zero. Beta hat will never be, at least with probability zero, it will be exactly equal to zero. Because this, the z has a continuous distribution. So we have consistency, but we do not have variable selection. We do not have beta hat equal to zero. But we also know that the lasso can actually put that equal to zero. So it's important that we look at this separately next to consistency. So what we are now interested in is this set as hat, this set of variables which the lasso or one of its modifications that you're using deems to be the set of relevant variables. So it has coefficients which are not set equal to zero. Now there are two things we will distinguish. First, we will distinguish what happens to actual relevant variables. So that would mean the true set of relevant variables is S0. What we would want is that this is contained in our set S hat. So that means that all relevant variables are actually found. On the other hand, we can also be interested in the irrelevant variables and making sure that they are actually discarded. So in that case, what we want is Basically, the opposite is that the complement of the set F0, the complement of the relevant variables, are of course, the irrelevant variables, are actually included in the kicked out variables in your estimation, the complement of the ones that are kept. Now, what we would want is that the probability of these sets are going to 1. So that if your sample becomes large enough, then the probability that you actually include, for instance, all the relevant variables here in condition one converges to one. So these two, we treat them separately because they don't have in principle the same meaning. In particular, one would generally care most about the first condition. Right? We would not want to leave out any relevant variables. 
So therefore, this condition, we first look at it separately, say we only look at condition one. Now, if this condition holds, what we say is it does variable screening, or you might know this under the term conservative selection. So for instance, we know if we just look at model selection methods, that AIC, Aikaki's information criterion, does conservative selection. So it includes all the relevant variables, but it might actually include a bit too many of variables. So some of the irrelevant ones will be, could be kept as well. Now, if we actually don't want that, if we want to have both conditions hold, so all relevant variables in and all irrelevant variables out, then we're of course looking at the condition that the set that we estimate as hat is equal to the true set of relevant variables as zero. So if this probability of these two sets being equal converges to one, then we say that the method does consistent variable selection. So in that case, in the limit, it will be able to perfectly distinguish between relevant and irrelevant variables. Again, making the link to regular model selection, we know that BIC uh, provides this. So you might wonder why don't we just directly want, always want consistent selection rather than just conservative. Again, keep in mind that these are asymptotic results. So we're looking at these things holding when their sample is increasing. There is, of course, a risk if you are very strict, like with BIC, you want consistent selection, then in any, in, of course, in finite samples, the risk that you delete relevant variables becomes larger. So you might just want to play it on the safe side and therefore go for conservative selection. Now, it turns out that there's one very important assumption that we will need. And I will explain, in, again, in the orthogonal design case, I will explain why we will need it, but let me already give it. And this is the so-called beta-min condition. And beta-min condition tells us that all of the relevant betas, so in particular the smallest ones, so the minimum of all j in the set of relevant variables, is in absolute value larger than some lower bound, c of n. And this lower bound, it can be a function of n and p, particular can be the functions given here, but it should be basically bounded away from zero. So in terms of interpretation, what this means is that all relevant variables should have coefficients that are sufficiently large to be detected. Now, on the one hand, this makes sense. And right? if you would have, of course, coefficients which are extremely small, you cannot really expect them to be picked up. On the other hand, there's also, as we will see in uh, particular later on in the course, in part three of the course, where we look at inference, we'll see that relying on this assumption can be actually very dangerous. Because how do we know in practice that indeed all our coefficients are large enough? There is no way, of course, to check that. Now, what I'm going to do here mostly is I'm going to take it as this. And if we do that, then it, of course, it does make sense. So it basically what it tells us is, if you don't interpret this condition as saying, oh, my relevant coefficients are larger than this lower bound. But if we interpret it instead as saying, we capture, we can capture all those relevant coefficients that are larger than the lower bound, accepting that we might not be able to pick up the small ones, then of course, uh, this is a reasonable condition. All right, so let's look now at, again, the case of orthogonality, because there we can actually derive analytical solutions. So we already derived the, the lasso under orthogonality, and it was this soft thresholding estimator that is given again here. Right, so if the least squares estimator of that j component is uh, relatively close to zero, particular closer than lambda over two, we thresh, we put on the threshold and we set everything equal to zero. If it's not, if it's larger, then we shrink it with a rate of lambda over two towards zero. Now, what I did before was um, in the previous analysis, I looked at, at the asymptotic distribution of the least squares estimator. And then based on that, I said, well, my beta hat, I could approximately view it as something 
beta plus something normal. Now I'm going to make my life even a bit easier here. I'm going directly to assume normality of my error terms. Because in that case, if I assume normality, then this normal distribution is actually exact. So I don't need to say it holds approximately. So and, and indeed, then I can in fact say that my beta hat is normally distributed with mean beta and the variance of sigma squared over n. Now I'm going to work on this condition here because it will make writing the probability statements a bit easier. Um, note that you might also interpret it as this being approximately true and then we're back in this setting here. Now what I'm also going to assume, and again it's just because to make my, my, my step, writing steps a bit easier, I'm going to assume that sigma squared is equal to 1, which means I don't have to carry the sigma around everywhere. Now, once we, we, we recognize that, we can say that my beta hat j, my lasso estimator, is actually distributed as the soft thresholding estimator applied to something normal with mean beta j and variance 1 over n. Or alternatively, something beta j plus a standard normal divided by square root n. So I'm directly going to plug that in into these uh, expressions. And the reason why I do that is because what I'm in the end interested in is the probability that my beta hat j is equal to zero. This probability tells me if this goes to one, then I know that in the limits, this particular variable j will, will actually be set to zero uh, with probability one. And I can therefore use that to judge a variable screening or consistent estimate uh, variable selection. Now, this, what is the probability that I set my j estimate equal to zero, well, it's a probability that, of course, I apply my threshold. So it's a probability that this maximum actually appears at zero. Well, that means it's a probability that this term here in absolute values is smaller or equal to lambda over two, or that actually that term without absolute values is between lambda over two and minus lambda over two. Well, this, of course, I can just manipulate these equations to only get my standard normal in the middle. And then I can see that this is just a probability uh, of, a, of a, be a standard normal being within certain bounds, in particular, this lower bound and this upper bound. And I can rewrite that in terms of the normal distribution. So here, capital phi indicates the CDF of the standard normal. So I have the CDF at the upper bound minus the CDF at the lower bound. And now what I want, because I first want to look at variable screening, I want that if my true beta j is not zero, so if I actually have a relevant variable, I want also to have the probability that my beta hat j is set equal to zero to, this, to go to zero. I don't want my relevant variables to get kicked out. Now obviously what we'll get is that it depends on the relation between lambda and beta j, because those are the key players in this probability. So let's look at the case where beta j is larger than zero. This is without loss of generality. You can do the same for the case beta j smaller than zero. I'm just going to focus here on one of these cases. And then I can look at what happens in the bounds. Now we have square root n lambda over two minus beta j so you see here in our upper bound. So this is the first part here. Note that if my beta j is going to be larger than lambda over two, at least for large n, then I have something here which is smaller than something that I subtract. I know lambda is positive, this minus something, so this will become negative. Well, I multiply by square root n, something negative, so that would go to minus infinity. Now, if I do that a bit more formally, I could say, well, suppose that beta j minus lambda over 2 is bigger or equal than some small number cn. And the cn would be larger than 0, at least for large n. 
but it actually could even go to zero. So you could even have those close together as long as when I multiply cn by square root n, it goes to infinity. So as long as beta j is just a bit larger than lambda, then this whole expression will converge to minus infinity. Because we can simply, of course, then just uh, here replace lambda of 2 minus beta j with, in that case, its, its upper bound of minus cn. Now, this is not a very strong condition because remember what we assumed? Well, we assumed beta j to be larger than zero, right? so that's fine. And we also know that lambda should go to zero. So of course, for any fixed positive number of beta j, you can always find an n such that lambda is going to be smaller than that number. I take beta j equal to 0 0.01. Might, you might think that it's very small. Well, lambda is going to zero for larger and larger n, so at some point lambda has to go drop below 0 0.01. So this condition will always be true that I need here for a fixed positive number, beta j. Now, in fact, I can even have beta j shrinking towards zero. I'm not going to discuss that at this point too much. I will come back to that extensively in the third part of the course, because you might think that this does not really make sense. But there are cases where actually it does make sense. More on that later, let's for now just look at beta j mostly as small fixed positive numbers. Of course, it could also be large positive numbers, but then it's trivial that this will hold. Now, if we go back one slide, then what we have here in the other probability, in the other part of the normal distribution, the, the probability that we subtract, we have lambda plus beta j. Now, if both are positive, of course, this will always be positive, but there's a minus in front, and again, we multiply by square root n, so this will again go to minus infinity. Now, again, here we write it out a bit more uh, precisely. So as long as either beta times j times square root n goes to infinity, which of course, if you take a fixed number beta j, this is always true, or lambda times square root n goes to infinity, which is not per se true, but it would be true for reasonable choices of lambda. So as long as one of these are true, then this will always hold, because either minus square root n times lambda will go to minus infinity, or minus square root n times beta j will go to infinity. Well, in the other, if the other does not go to infinity, it has to go to zero because of the sign. So we need just one of these two conditions which seem entirely reasonable. The first one is always reasonable, for a fifth, or even not even reasonable, it's always true for a fixed beta j larger than zero. Then we know that this whole expression goes to minus infinity. So if you plug those things back in, then we know that the left-hand probability will go to minus infinity, and the right-hand probability will also go to minus infinity. And there's a typo here, I will correct this typo to read minus infinity instead. And so what we have is phi at minus infinity minus phi at minus infinity, well, that's obviously zero. So indeed, in that case, the probability that beta hat j is equal to zero is zero. So you would have indeed variable screen. Now, as I discussed in the previous slide, what we really need for that need to hold is that beta j is larger than lambda over two. So it should be at least some small number away from lambda over two. Now, we can of course plug in a rate for lambda, right? So if we go back to the rate that was used before, L and P over N, then the square root of that. That simply means that beta j should be larger than some constant times that rate. So it should, uh, be at least as large as that for, for this condition to hold. Then we need that for all j in S0. And now we are really basically back at the beta min condition, which essentially said that the smallest number of all, of all the beta j should be larger than this threshold, and this threshold, this lower bound, could depend on p and n. And so this is the reason uh, essentially, intuitively, why we need to have this beta min condition.
So we can have small beta j's, but not too small beta j's. And so in fact, in this asymptotic framework, they could even go to, to zero with n, but not too fast. Now again, having coefficients which change with the sample size is, is a bit awkward. Um, but as we will see later on, then it will actually turn out to be quite useful to look at those coefficients. For now, if we just look at beta j as a fixed coefficient, it just means translating to small samples that the coefficients should not be too small. Now let's look at the other direction. Look at beta j's which are actually equal to zero, which we then want to get kicked out. So we want also that the corresponding beta hat j is also equal to zero with probability one in the limit. So if that condition holds as well, then we have, of course, consistent variable selection. Well, we do, can do the same steps. We get, we calculate the probability that beta hat j is equal to zero. Again, on orthogonal design, we can use, use the same formula, but now we can directly plug in zero for the betas. And so we just get this very simple expression that we take the normal, standard normal CDF at squared n lambda over two minus the standard normal at minus squared n lambda over two. Well, if square root n times lambda goes to infinity, then of course you can directly see that the first one goes to infinity and the second one goes to minus infinity. So in this case, our beta hat j will be set equal to zero with probability in the limit phi of infinity, which is one, minus phi of minus infinity, which is zero. So this actually is equal to one. So indeed, well, that's exactly what we wanted. So if the true beta j is equal to zero and square root and lambda goes to infinity, then we actually have consistent variable selection. Now, we need to think about what this means, this square root n times lambda to infinity, because that is not such a trivial condition that is always true. In fact, if you look at the standard rate, right, where we took before lambda equal, or growing at a rate of square root l and p over n, well, just multiply by n, by square root n, then we see that square root n lambda is growing at rate l and p. So this is indeed going to infinity if p is going to infinity, but only barely. And in fact, if p is fixed, then this will not even go to infinity. And so you would even not even have this result. So this, this is not such a trivial rate to have satisfied. So opposite what we saw before where we said well lambda should go to zero for f to have variable screening to have consistent variable selection we actually need to have a strong penalty relatively strong penalty and of course this also makes sense right you need to have a strong penalty to kick things out and so there is this balance between having a penalty which is not too strong because it would kick out the relevant variables but also not too weak because it would leave irrelevant variables in your model Now, if we look at this beyond the orthogonal design case, of course, things become very complicated again quickly. Again, look at the relevant sections in, in one of these two books for more further details. Now, what I just want to say about this is that we need a certain condition called the irrepresentable irre condition next to the already mentioned beta min conditions. Now, in, what this condition tells us is that relevant and irrelevant variables should be sufficiently distinct from each other, meaning roughly that they should not have too high correlations. Well, for orthogonal design, this is obviously true. I mean, they're, they're as far away from each other as they could be. But in general, of course, this is not always true. And it turns out that this actually is a very restrictive assumption um, in, for, for most applications. And this is related to the issue that I discussed also regarding the, well, the lasso um, and elastic net. And that is that if variables are highly correlated, the lasso has difficulty distinguish between which one is actually the relevant one and which one is an irrelevant one. And it would tend to pick one 
almost at random. So the lasso is not really great for variable selection. So should we use elastic net then? Well, that would be of course one option, but it's also not really solving all the problems. Uh, what, it, what it would do is it includes all of the correlated variables rather than at random, which is better, but it also means that irrelevant variables are kept in your model. So if you really want to go for variable selection, what is a much better alternative is the adaptive lasso that I also discussed in the previous lectures. Now remember again the adaptive lasso, which has this form, where instead of having just the sum of the absolute values of the beta j's, we, in the penalty term, we multiply the absolute value with a weight wj. And this weight is based on an initial estimation. And it should be such that if the initial, initial estimation gives you a parameter far, or an estimate far away from zero, then the weight should become very uh, small. You don't want to put another penalty on it because it has already proven to be relevant. If, it, if you get a uh, initial estimate which is close to zero, the weight should become large. You really you want to put a higher penalty on it because you think that actually this is an, is an irrelevant variable. So typically we take one divided by some power of the absolute value of the initial estimate. And indeed, if you work out the, the proofs uh, for the adaptive lasso, then this can actually do consistent variable selection without this irrepresentable condition. So this actually is theoretically capable of handling variable selection better than the regular lasso because we do this sort of double penalty. It's not just the lambda which is giving the penalty, but it's also this wj which is putting on an additional penalty on irrelevant variables. So let's look again at orthogonal design to get some uh, feeling of how this method does a different job. Again, from the previous lecture, we derived the analytical expression of the adaptive lasso. And uh, if I use least squares as my initial estimate, then I can directly plug that in here. So again, using least squares uh, as an initial estimate here, I'm replacing least, the least squares estimator with its distribution. Right? So it's a, a random variable which has a normal distribution, mean beta j varies 1 over n. So the difference is, of course, this term here, where we divide lambda over 2 by this initial estimate to the power nu. Right, take nu equal to 0 and you're back to the regular lasso case. So again, we can do the same calculation as we did before. And what we want to look at is the probability that we set variable j in the adaptive lasso equal to 0. Well, that is, of course, exactly when this condition here the maximum of these two is, is occurs at zero. You can do it directly from here, or you can go back to the previous lecture and it's recognize that we, that we already there found the condition saying, well, when, when is it set equal to zero? We have the least squares estimator, absolute value one plus nu to the power one plus nu is smaller equal than lambda over two. So plug in its distribution. We can just rewrite everything to only get z in the middle and we see again what we have is a certain area if the standard normal is between this lower bound and this upper bound then uh, that is the probability again i can rewrite it in terms of the normal distribution so i have an upper bound here and my minus my lower bound there well then we can again then look at what happens when either beta j is zero or non-zero so let me start again by looking at beta j larger than zero. Same argument as before. We need that beta j is larger than lambda over two, but now to this power, and this power simply comes from the initial estimator, the weights that we're giving. Uh, with that writing things out, we get this power here, one divided by one plus nu. Now, if we again have that this is true then we can show that this upper bound that we had actually converges to minus infinity well 
same argument that for the, of course, for the um, lower bounds, where we have with these two being positive, that this goes to minus infinity anyways. So we can again show that the upper bound goes to minus infinity, lower bound goes to minus infinity. So you get phi at minus infinity, minus phi at minus infinity, which is zero. So the crucial condition is again the first one, beta j should be large enough. So plugging again a rate in for lambda, and so say c times squared ln p over n, we now get this condition for beta j. And so here we see that this condition is very similar as the last one, it's slightly different because instead of having the power one over two, we have power one over two plus two nu. So that means that actually we have a higher lower bound than we had for the lasso. So it means we can only detect bigger coefficients than with the lasso. So this of course also makes sense. It, it comes from the fact that we put this additional penalty on and therefore smallish coefficients might get too large of a, of a weight in the adaptive lasso. Now what happens when beta j is equal to zero? Well, same arguments as before. We just uh, plug in everything um, into the probability here. And of course we note that just now beta j is equal to zero. So we get uh, this expression where, which is similar as before we had squared n times lambda over two, but now to the power one over one plus nu. And the lower bound is just the same number, but then the negative one. So what we now need, we again want this probability to convert to one. So we want this part to go to infinity and we want this part to go to minus infinity. Well, to have that go to infinity and minus infinity, we need that square root n times lambda to the power of one divided by one plus nu goes to infinity. Well, you can also write that differently, say that uh, lambda times n to the power one plus nu over two should go to infinity. So if we have that, then of course we get phi of infinity minus phi of minus infinity, which is actually equal to one. So for instance, take nu equal to one, which would be the standard case for adaptive loss. So then this rate becomes n times lambda should go to, to, to infinity. Whereas before for the regular lasso, we had square root n times lambda should go to infinity. Obviously, since we multiply it with more here, this is a weaker restriction. So here we actually have more room to select our lambda in a different way. And that is of course really also the adaptive lasso. So it might get harder to de detect smallish coefficients, it becomes easier to detect zero coefficients and kick them out. So for instance, here, the standard rate will definitely uh, suffice even with fixed P because we get N uh, times square root something divided by N. So we already have a square root N factor there, let alone what we have for P. And in fact, any new larger than zero will make this rate work even for fixed P. Now, we establish these rates, and then actually what we have is another oracle property. So uh, we talked about oracle properties before. It relates to how well do we do compared to the oracle, which is all knowing and knows which, uh, which uh, variables are actually relevant. But what we, have, what we found here is that if you do adaptive lasso, then basically, again, if you have with the beta min condition, then you can do as well as the oracle because you can perfectly pick out this set as zero. Right? You can perfectly pick out which variables are relevant and which ones are irrelevant. 
Now, final step we are going to take here is to look at yet another Oracle property, yet a stronger one, which is often called the Oracle property. So if people only talk about the Oracle property, it's about the strongest one, which says that not just do you get consistency at almost the same rate, not just can you pick up the relevant and irrelevant variables, but in fact, the asymptotic distribution, if you would do inference, would be the same as if the Oracle would directly from the start know which variables are relevant and apply the least squares estimator to only the relevant ones without a penalty. And this is a fact that turns out to be true for the adaptive lasso. So this is a very amazing result. So this result tells us you, you start with a, a model of maybe a thousand variables of which 10 are actually only relevant. But all this searching through all these possibly irrelevant variables and coming up with your final model of having 10 variables does not change the asymptotic distribution of your estimator. So if you end up with your final model, you could just pretend, no, I, I knew this from the start and I just did least squares. And in fact, you could even do least squares on those 10 variables to the post lasso and it would not change your distribution at all. So uh, I think by the way I phrase this, it's already clear that we should be skeptical of such a, such a result. Mathematically, this is true. Right? Like, I'm not saying that there's any mathematical mistake in what we did or what people did, but we should be very careful to um, interpret that. And now here we come back to this crucial condition, this beta min condition, because it does rely heavily on this being true. So it relies heavily on all your relevant variables being large enough. But this is something we don't know in practice. And as we will see in uh, the, the later stages of this course, that if you rely on this Oracle property and rely therefore on this beta min condition, this can turn out pretty bad. So you can actually get strange uh, distortions that, well, if we believe the Oracle property should not be there. Now, this will require lots of different way of looking at the problem. So we're not going into it, into that now at this stage. At this stage, we're just going to, I just want to warn you that even though the Oracle property is actually, and it's a very cool result, it's also a very important result, but we should be careful how we, how we are going to uh, interpret that. Now, let's have a look and see if, if we can using our orthogonal design setup, if we can derive this Oracle property for the adaptive lasso. So we go back to the same expression for the adaptive lasso in terms of the distribution of the underlying least squares estimator and see what we can say about the distribution now of this adaptive lasso. Well, first of all, you might say, oh, this is the distribution, but of course there's still square root n here. So what's going to happen if n goes to infinity? Well, first thing to notice is that, well, given that we already established the fact that all relevant variables will be picked up, probability one, we'll know that actually so this maximum here will occur on the first element and not the second. Otherwise, of course, everything would be set to zero. So we know that the probability that the maximum of these two is actually the first will go to one. So in fact, for large enough n, we can just leave out this maximum and just write this term directly. So that's what I do here in the bottom line. I write out this term directly and I note here again that the sign of a variable times its absolute value is just equal to the variable itself. Right, so I, my, I can write my distribution approximately as beta j plus zj over square root n minus the sign times something with the penalty. Now this first part here is actually what I want to have because this is the least squares, the distribution of the least squares estimator. And what we should get is that the adaptive lasso has the same distribution as the least squares estimator. So let's look at what, this ha what happens with this second term that we found in our limit distribution. Well, note here that 
if I focus here on the sine first, the sine of beta j plus zj over square root n, this is just going to converge to the sine of beta j. So take for instance beta j larger than, than zero. Well, at some point n will become large enough such that this disturbance of the normal random variable is going to disappear. So if n is large enough, this whole thing will also with probability one be positive. So the sign of this quantity will actually just converge to the sign of beta j itself. Well, the same reasoning I can apply here in the denominator, where this absolute value will also for the same reasons just converge to the absolute value beta j. Now, let me keep lambda over 2 for the moment, because that's going to be the crucial part. And if I go back to this equation here, I'm going to rewrite that. So I'm going to get beta j to the other side, multiplied by square root n, because I want to look at this quantity here, square root n times beta hat minus beta, because that is the quantity that I want to derive the asymptotic distribution of. And this is the quantity that for least squares I know has a standard normal distribution. So what I have here is this zj, so this is the good part, because this is standard normal, and I have something which actually would create some sort of a bias. Now this is of course the problematic part, except if this goes to zero. Well, what do we have left in here is square root n times lambda over 2. Right, so here we just had lambda over 2, but now we get a square root n from multiplying everything with square root n. And so we directly see that this part goes to zero whenever square root n times lambda goes to zero. So to have the oracle property, to have a limit distribution identical to least squares, we need square root n times lambda to go to zero. So this is a much stronger condition than we had before. Before we just needed lambda to go to zero. Now we still need lambda to go to zero if we multiply it by square root n. So this tells us, well, adaptive lasso may be very good at kicking out irrelevant variables. And while it does not hurt for keeping the relevant ones, it will create problems in the distribution. It will create some sort of a bias in the limit distribution once we've blown up everything by square root n. Now, this of course then limits the range of lambdas that we can take. Now let's go back to the results that we had for, for consistent selection for that to flush. So, well, we had of course a beta min condition and we had this condition that the penalty should be strong enough and strong enough being that n to the power one plus nu over two times lambda should go to infinity. Now the good thing is that if I take a nu larger than zero, I can actually make both of these conditions be satisfied. Take for instance, nu equal to one then I get that, that n to the power 1 times lambda should go to infinity, but n to the power a half times lambda should go to 0. So anything that I choose for lambda in between n to the power a half up to n, any rate would work. Now, there is another issue here with the regular lasso, and this is something that is already remarkable. So here we actually have that no lambda exists that gives us all oracle properties. Even in the simple case of orthogonality, we have a problem. So we had before that square root n times lambda should go to infinity. Right? So we plug in here nu equal to zero. But of course, square root n times lambda cannot go to zero and to infinity at the same time. So either if we go for consistent variable selection, we let square root n times lambda go to infinity, then square root n times lambda cannot go to zero and we have a problem in the asymptotic distribution. Or if we were care about the asymptotic distribution, then we cannot have consistent variable selection. So that already tells us that we should be careful with these oracle properties. And also gives one reason why people have looked at the adaptive lasso rather than the regular lasso. All right, let's round up this part about the Lasso theory. So we have established now the full set of conditions for um, 
the lasso to, to find consistency, variable, consistent variable selection and the oracle property of having the same distribution as the least squares estimator. So consistency, that is quite general. So we can have many more predictors than, than observations and not too strong conditions. Variable screening is still reasonably okay. Variable selection is a problem already. It's quite strong conditions. So we still have the option there to go for the adaptive lasso. And indeed, the adaptive lasso needed to ask this under much less strong conditions. But in either case, for these oracle properties to hold, we need this beta min condition, which tells us that the relevant variables coefficients should be large enough to actually detect them. Now, however realistic or not these conditions may be, there is one issue that we have not looked at yet. And that is that in particular, those DGP assumptions we've been working on are actually not really suited for our econometric problems. These are all fairly simple conditions where we assume everything is nicely well behaved, IID even normally distributed. This is something that an econometrics typically does not does not hold for applications we would be interested in. So what I will do next in the next lecture is I will look at more econometric applications and see, well, does the lasso still work there or how do we, uh, how can we actually apply it in those kind of settings?